What we're going to practice is the sequence hymn, and it is a call and response. And my dear friend and colleague, John Franco, and I are going to practice with you. Okay? And I have different pages. What is the sequence hymn? What page do you have? Page nine. Okay, page nine. So what we're going to do, I'm going to switch places with you. We're going to have you all start. John Franco and I are going to do it once together. Okay? You know what? I'm going to, I'm going to yield to you. Tell us how we should do this. Question and answer, except for a set of words, which is, is a lamp to my feet. When we get to the point, is a lamp to my feet, we sing all together. All the rest of the hymn is a question and an answer. So what me and Michael thought to do was to divide, to split the church, the congregation, in two parts, which already, I think, more or less, we are a little bit even. Well yeah, done. Even enough. So, this part will take the first, the, the, the question, and this part will take the answer. So, the better way to explain this is to have me and Michael trying to Perfect. sing it and see how that works. Then, during the, 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 um, uh, the service, I will be at the piano. So, it will be also uh, easier to, to get the notes. So... I will start. So I'm this side. It's that side. Your word. Your word. Your word is a lamp to my feet. Your word. Your word is a lamp to my feet and light to my path and a light to my path your word your word is a lamp to my feet well done. I think we've got it. Great. And the folks that, you folks who are participating at home, you can decide. You have a choice which side you're going to sing on, and we won't know. Okay. All right? The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, To what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he is a demon, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, 
And anyone to whom the Son chooses to, re- to reveal him, come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come as the wind and cleanse. Come as the fire and burn. Convert and consecrate our lives to our great good and your great glory. Through Christ our Lord. Please be seated. Today's readings speak of of trust, of relationship, and of change. I was so struck by the New Testament, or the Old Testament reading, and perhaps you were too. This servant is sent on an extremely important mission. And what he doesn't do is talk to himself. You've heard Jesus in some of these parables will say, and and someone will say, you know, if they're given talents, for instance, to hang on to. And the guy says, so I said to myself, what am I going to do? If we're talking to ourselves, we're talking to a frightened, unhelpful child. If the answer was in each of us and we could just talk to ourselves, we wouldn't need church, we wouldn't need Jesus, and we would not need each other. A friend of mine, in a sharper way, says if you're talking to yourself, you're talking to a jerk. And I don't know how you talk to yourself, but a lot of times the voices I use to talk to myself are not edifying. And so, this business of relying on God, and this is exactly what Paul is talking about in the letter to the Romans. I have to correct that. There are no seven letters that he wrote to Rome. One was enough. He he achieved that. We said there was the seventh letter of Paul to the Romans. And Paul says what all of us have said at various points. Don't, well, not that, but why do I continue to do the thing that I don't want to do? How often have we gone to someone's house or been with a friend and we are absolutely committed that we are not going to raise this topic of what they need to change in order to be happy, even if they give us the recital of all the things they continue to talk about but do nothing about. Do you all have that with with your kids or your parents? Can we just have a show of hands whether or not you ever have that conversation? I'm just, we're just not going to talk about that. I'm just not going to. And then, and then all of a sudden, you just can't help. But just, I want to offer... I can do it better this time. This time, I'll say it in such a way that they hear me. It just doesn't work. And it's not because people don't want to change or see the need to change. But it is, and this is hard for Americans to hear. Maybe it's hard for everyone to hear. but we often cannot change ourselves. This is what Paul is talking about with sin. We are embedded in a reality in which, for reasons that are confounding, we are not able on our own to fully be the people that we are called to be. And that's one of the reasons why we need God and we need each other. I had breakfast with someone yesterday, someone who I don't know very well from the parish, who told me the story of seeing a, a, a man who was um, indigent um, walking into a subway shop. 
And he's got a very open heart. And, and uh, this person that I had breakfast with, and he, had, and he said, you know, I, I should buy the guy a meal. He started walking over. He said, no, that's a dumb idea. I don't, he, might, he might reject that. He might just tell me to mind my own business. And then he walked back again. I said, no, I should do it. And then he said, what are people going to think? What are people going to think of me if I buy this guy lunch? And then the third time he turned around, he bought the guy lunch. Very pleasant guy, he said, you know. He wasn't, I didn't receive the wisdom of Christ in that encounter. He wasn't a guru, but he was a good enough guy. And there was something fitting, what I heard now, there's just something fitting. An intuition was stirred. The possibility of contact with another, of relationship, was kindled. And then the first instinct is to say, yeah, that's a bad idea. But if we hang in there, we eventually can hear what it is that we're called to do. What was so instructive for me is how honest he was. Because, you know, God can work with that. If I just keep those kind of stories to myself, if I'm, if I'm only about sharing the victories and not about the times that I turn away from that which I know I'm called to do, we're no use to each other. We're no use to each other because we're simply in a state of competition. This resistance to change, this inability but also resistance to change, is voiced in the gospel. And it's voiced in the gospel in, in a couple of ways. What Jesus is talking about in the children in the market that are saying, um, you know, let's play music. Uh, and they say, no, we're not going to do that. And then let's play, let's play funeral. And this would have been the girls saying this to the boys because they would be the ones who would be the wailing. Let's play funeral. I'm not going to play funeral. Let's play wedding. Let's play music. No, no, I'm not going to play music. And then nothing happens. We don't want to do what we don't want to do and we won't do it. And what Jesus is saying is, I'd like you to open up to the possibility that doing the thing you don't want to do may actually bring about new life. And one of the ways we resist this is by discrediting people and ideas. Jesus says this. He said, you know, you guys, John comes to you. He's wearing camel's clothing. He's a bit of an ascetic. He wasn't eating or drinking, and you demonized him. I come drinking and serving with all the wrong people, and you demonize me. Who has to come? Who has to come before we're willing to open up and saying, I can try that. I can try that. There was a wonderful woman, God rest her soul, um, Mary Lundy in, in South Haven, Michigan. And, and Mary, Mary was a an, an very elderly woman. Um, and she had some dementia. But we were doing a, a Lenten program and right in the middle of it, Mary stops and says, you know, I don't know if I would have followed Jesus. I mean, this is a saint in the church. I'm afraid because he probably smelled. And he probably didn't dress very well. That I may not have followed Jesus. Wow. Wow. One of the ways that I think we can relate to this is actually around the issue of racism and, and, joy, and what happened with the killing of George Floyd. So many of us, when that happened, we said, and I said it, I had no idea. 
We're watching clip after clip of good policemen, good people, somehow unable to see that the person they are shooting or otherwise oppressing is actually the one that they are supposed to protect. A lot of us, I had no idea. I no longer drive by and see someone stopped on the side of the road by the police. I no longer have the same reaction I did two years ago. I don't know what's going on. I used to tell myself that I did. But then on the other side of that, we have this sort of damnation of being woke, of wokeism. And I have to tell you, there is a thing in our culture, this political correctness, where if you're not saying the words correctly, it is absolutely okay to be abused. There's sort of a coerced language. But even though that is happening in the culture, it doesn't mean that we haven't been asleep and we need to stay awake. This is what Jesus is talking about. I am coming to you. Reality is coming to you in ways that you may not be able to grapple with, but you need to stay alert and name it and not simply say, well, that's political correctness. I don't have to do that. But to enter into whatever the reality is, How many of us would be willing to say to our significant other or our children or God help us, our parents, I would really like to hear what I am doing that you see that is counterproductive to my own flourishing and the flourishing of my family. How often have we longed for a family member to give us that kind of opening to be able to say, wow, what a courageous thing that is. We cannot change ourselves. We can put ourselves in the way of God to be changed. We come here week after week because things are not all right. That we know we have to change, we have to grow. And we know that there are others who need to be loved so that it's safe to change. The church is in the business of change. I invite all of us to open our hearts and hear where it is God is calling us to place ourselves so that we may be in the way of God, in the way of God, in the way of change and growth. In just a little while, we're going to be doing birthday blessings and, and anniversary blessings. And the prayer is always this. May you continue to grow in the stature of Christ in this new year. That you may become the person that God had in mind when he created you. May that be our prayer for ourselves. Amen.